Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, and this is our monthly video meeting. Um, we've been doing these for a long time. Like, this isn't a coronavirus thing. This is just how we work in Fedora. Um, normally, most of our business is done on mailing lists and IRC-based you know, text chat meetings and tickets. Um, but we also want to have kind of some high bandwidth conversations. And so once a month, we do these things where we get somebody doing something interesting and important in the project and bring them in to chat with the council about what that, you know, what that part of the project is doing, what they'd like to share with the rest of Fedora, and what they could use from the council in support. Um, as I hope you have heard me hear before, or hear me say before, that's the way hearing works, um, Fedora is a project that's made up of people. Uh, when you say Fedora, uh, don't think of an operating system. Think of, you know, this group of awesome, friendly people who work together to make an operating system. And as part of our project, um, you know, we make the Fedora Workstation Edition, which is our flagship desktop in a lot of ways, but we also have a bunch of other desktop environments that different groups in Fedora put together. And um, by far the most popular of those is the KDE Plasma spin. And so uh, Rex is here today to talk to us about that spin and how things are going in it and you know what's cool about it and where the future is going and all those kind of things. Hi, Rex, welcome. Hi, hi, friends, and Matthew. I guess you're a friend too. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I just put together a few bullet points to kind of highlight some of the things that I like about Fedora and what helped make the KD spin great, uh, and then some challenges, and then I figured we could just uh, chat after that. Um, my quick bullet points of things that made uh, Fedora a great place to make uh, a spin for KDE. Uh, years ago, I've been involved in the Fedora project since, well, almost the beginning. Um, and then I think it was Fedora 7 was the first one where we made a KDE spin. So that was a long time ago. Um, and that's where I formally joined the KDE project in their, um, they call it the KDE EV. So anyway, some of the things that made uh, KDE a good fit for Fedora for me, uh, and that helped bring people in is uh, community. Uh, stuff that I enjoyed about Fedora and that uh, brought people around the work that I was doing was that um, I, well, what's the movie? Um, Drawing a blank, uh, Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you build something great, uh, people will come, and that's basically what happened. And then it helps that when you see uh, invigorated uh, contributors uh, wanting to help, you jump in and basically mentor them and bring them along, and then they can do the same thing for others as well. The other thing that has worked great, the, uh, item number two on my bullet point was kind of upstream-downstream collaboration. Uh, helps really well in, in, especially in about the last few years, and that we can bring in upstream developers to work in Fedora and vice versa. So uh, it helps get our changes and improvements pushed upstream, and it helps to get their work into Fedora downstream really fast, and then working out any uh, conflicts or that arises from that uh, on occasion. Um, what was the other point that I hear? Oh, it's kind of a nice thing, but it's been nice that uh, being in Fedora, every once in a while we can get someone from Red Hat that's especially directly involved with RHEL and KDE there to work with us in Fedora so we can get some of the things that they want improved worked into Fedora first, right? So that's kind of a, been a nice side benefit. Um, and then some, I was going to highlight some challenges. Um, yes, please do. Some, something uh, in the past couple of years, I went through kind of an employment change, and that made my involvement in Fedora taper off a little bit. So that meant that my care and feeding of the KDE SIG and the Fedora, 
KD spin uh, was kind of on autopilot for, I'd say, for maybe a year, year and a half. Um, that's gotten better. Uh, I've been at my current job for a while now. I'm very happy and getting to the point where I can like start ramping up my uh, uh, Fedora involvement again and start kind of, again, this care and feeding business goes a long way, right? If you don't yeah. uh, water your garden, eh, you get some weeds, you know? So, uh, so a couple things that I wanted to at least highlight to the board that's been, or sorry, council. That's been, <laughs> You're old uh, school, you can be forgiven on that slip. <laughs> that's been kind of a challenge recently is one, one unfortunate setback to uh, upstream uh, collaboration was that a couple years ago, um, we had some upstream contributors that got uh, KD Upstream to use Fedora containers a lot for their con their uh, continuous integration project, and they hit they hit a snag a while back. And long story short, they don't use Fedora anymore because of a bad interaction there. And I, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, uh, you can look up Fesco issue. 1784, uh, at least be aware of that issue. And I'd really love to be able to avoid cases like that again, because that was one case where we had made really good uh, inroads upstream with KDE and then that soured their, their take on using Fedora for anything. Um, Oh yeah, and then there was a recent uh, Fedora Devel thread about the Fedora Jam spin switching away from using KDE, which is kind of a challenge. And it's probably best if we take the details of that offline. I don't want to like air dirty laundry in a meeting like this, but it basically there's some negative there's some negative uh, negativity and um, a couple individuals that we need to figure out how to deal with better, I hope. I'm trying not to get distracted by the Fesco ticket here. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't necessarily need to dig into that in the meeting. I just wanted to make sure that at least those of you who weren't aware of that, because it happened a couple of years ago, that, and I don't, we don't need to revisit how that happened. I just want to have that in people's minds that, if something like that happens again, I'd really like to avoid that kind of resolution again. That's all. Yeah. And I think that's that's the end of my uh, specific bullet points that I had. Um, oh, I I suppose uh, a general one too is that we we've had some. Yeah, the good news is that. I said that I'd be able to be involved more, and then there's been a recent influx of contributors recently, so that has uh, been exciting for me, yay. And um, a lot of them are really gung-ho on trying to improve the Wayland situation for Plasma, so that's kind of exciting too. Cool, that um, was, yeah, that was gonna be one of my questions. Um, what, what's going on with Wayland? Um, but also in general, um, what's new in KDE and new in Fedora's KDE spin specifically? Like, what what can what can users look forward to in the next year? Um, excellent question. I don't have a really good answer to that. Like I said, kind of the KDE spins kind of been flying by on autopilot for a really long time. It's been fairly uh, robust and solid and um, stable but that means not much has changed either um like I said the bit like you said and i said one of the big changes we're looking at tentatively targeting uh really 34 fedora 34 is is to finally see if we can get the wayland situation good enough to use it by default okay yeah neil's happy about that i think neil's actually one of the main, main people pulling behind that aren't you yeah anyway. um I've been we can testing blame him. on my laptop for a while, so now uh, I'm I'm hoping to get the last bit of bugs working with KD Upstream. I've been filing some bug reports, and um, my hope I, I thought we'd do it for 33, but like it's still just slightly too buggy. 
Um, I'm confident, though, that we could probably do it for 34. And so that's something that I'm I'm personally very excited for. Cool. Um, yeah. So. Even on autopilot, uh, KDE continues to be very popular with, within Fedora. Um, I have some preliminary numbers from my DNF counting project uh, where um, KDE spin is about 5% of Fedora systems out there, which is uh, much higher than any of the other uh, non-workstation desktop spins. Um, and um, it is my... Um, anecdotal impression that that percentage is probably higher amongst some of the active uh, active Fedora contributors. I think it's probably more like 10 to 15%. Um, that's just kind of my feeling in talking to people. It, it's pretty popular. Um, and one of the things uh, Marie and I have talked about, um, we've kind of talked, talked about it a little bit in general, is we're, uh, we're due for a refresh of Git Fedora and the Fedora website set up. Um, and one of the things we'd like to do, we, we, we always wanted that to have like the spins page to be a way to like showcase these different desktop technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, it, marketing is always hard. And um, I think we, we did the right approach with our targeted marketing thing for the additions. Um, I don't regret it, but I would also like to see a way that we could showcase, you know, all this work that is happening in the project and that people are doing cool things on, um, you know, so that people who are looking for it can find it and so that you can show off to people, hey, there's this, you know, other desktop option. If that's something you'd be interested in, here it is for you. Um, so we're, we're looking at that as we look at doing web, web redesign. Hopefully that will, I, I would like um, to see the KDE website uh, be a little more than just a cookie cutter template thing that kind of show, shows it off and, and gets, you know, gets people excited about it. There would be, so, be a hub for KDE users. So for the point of that, actually, um, Upstream KDE and I have been talking about maybe having them contribute to making a more um, uh, fleshed out markety kind of, uh, uh, of website for Fedora KDE, blending the Fedora branding with, with um, Upstream KDE branding. To like maybe give like a more standout approach to um, promoting the KDE spin. I don't know exactly how that'll work out right now. Everyone's fighting with our bad old tools that are not working on people's computers, but that that's a whole different fun set of problems. But yeah, this is something that um, KDE upstream. A lot of the some of the, some of the developers are actually Fedora KDE users, and they're they kind of want this improved as well. So there's some interest on both sides here. Cool. Um, let's see, yeah, um, community care and feeding and things. Rex, I'm really glad to hear you say that you're going to have some more time for this because that's, I mean, basically any group that's successful in Fedora, you know, has, you, you've got to have, um, basically tent pole people, you know, hold, holding up the, you, you know, the gardening metaphor is good too, but, you know, um, if, if there's not someone there holding up the tent, um, when people come to it, you know, it collapse, you just have a bunch of collapsed fabric on the ground and it doesn't look like anything's going on. Like this, you know, happened, you know, to uh, a while ago, the docs team where there just basically was nobody there and then people show up like, I want to contribute and then nobody's <laughs> there. So yeah, just yeah. Uh, you know, ha having, having the um, core group that, you know, meets regularly and does these things really, really helps. Right. So speaking uh, on that, for example, the low hanging fruit for me was, you know, I fell off the bandwagon of like leading regular um, meetings, even if they're short, you still have to have yeah. uh, meetings and and uh, transparency and uh, more of, you know, letting people know what you're working on. That helps, yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, Without getting into specifics, um, you know, there there is a perception that just some Fedora in general, not just KDE, um, but it is sometimes hard to get along with, and that we have strong personalities, and that um, thing there are. Uh, it is scary to interact on some of the Fedora mailing lists, IRC channels, because um, someone who disagrees with you and has been in the project for a long time uh, may may yell at you. It would be difficult. Like how, how do we how do we change that perception? How do we make Fedora uh, you know, KDE more friendly to people? That's hard. Um, you basically have to make sure that most you know 
people's either their initial reaction or a majority of their interactions are positive. Um, if the first thing they see is negative, that's, you know, someone's uh, first impression is really going to turn them off. So, yes, yeah, so we have to make sure that people's first impressions are good. And then, if anything, try to drown out the negative negativity with positivity. And then, you know, make, uh, make things clear of what is good interactions, uh, what is acceptable, uh, what's good, and then highlight what is not acceptable and what's bad that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to stand for stuff like that. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me and is important basic steps going forward. Hi, Rex. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Plasma 5.19 the 19 was just released in early June. Uh, how, uh, how, when is planned to, to land on Fedora? Plasma 5.19, you said? Yes, that it was released in early June. So when you say in Fedora, you mean like a, a released Fedora versus Rawhide? Because it's been in Rawhide for a while. <laughs> Yes, in a, in a stable release for, okay. for our um, user, because I use Rawhide. I know it's in Rawhide, but... Yeah, um, that's another thing that I want to get involved with and help push forward. Uh, in the past, we were pretty aggressive on uh, pushing um, uh, mi minor version updates in, into at least the latest Fedora release. Um, and that didn't happen yet with 5.19. Uh, so my initial goal, if we're talking about Fedora, uh, Plasma releases and Fedora releases, um, initial, my first goal is to try to get 5.18 available for Fedora 31. My primary uh, interest in that is, is because 5.18 is a, one of uh, the upstream's Plasma's uh, long-term support releases. So... That's always good. That actually raises mm -hmm. questions for me. Uh, oh, you finish what you're saying, then I'll, then I'll ask. Sure. Um, tentatively. I mean, nothing's set in stone. Uh, and, then, and then we can consider uh, working on the 519 for Fedora 32. Uh, so my questions were, what, what is the, I, I have no idea, actually. I know GNOME releases basically like clockwork twice a year in a way that works out pretty well for the Fedora six month release schedule. Uh, what is KDE's release cadence like? Is there a fixed schedule? Um, and are there uh, LTS releases picked um, arbitrarily or is it like every four releases or something like that? So um, KDE releases are pretty close to how GNOME does it. I think it, they aim for about every six months as well. Um, and that fits for initial releases, of course. Um, and then as far as, oh, thank Luigi. <laughs> um, as far as uh, LTS goes, I think they just periodically pick one uh, every, and then four, every four to six releases. That ends up being every two to three years, they end up picking something. Um, so actually I can kind of answer what the, the schedule, the cadence is. So the Plasma desktop, DAC, which includes KD frameworks and the Plasma applications, is usually released just a shy over quarterly, basically every four months, three to four months. And Thanks then, for the they, <laughs> yeah, um, and then they they cut new um, LTS releases, I believe, every two years. Mostly, that's lined up with um, with Ubuntu's LTS cycle, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, Pino can. Uh, Try to it can correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, and Sousa, right? So we're so the LTS releases are lined up with SLES, uh, with SLES point release, service pack rebase releases, as well as Ubuntu LTS releases. So that's a, essentially every two years. Um. So what uh, one of one of the comments there is that um, there is no single KDE, um, or no, there's. What, so the plasma is released on its own cadence, and then applications are released. Are, are applications released in in bundles, or are those just basically as they're updated? So they're bun. So some app. So the there's like rings uh, or tiers of applications. 
uh, this is a concept very familiar to you, Matt. Um, so the core set of applications, as well as the premier extra set of applications, tend to be released along with the Plasma desktop. Then there's this whole like wide universe of KD applications that follow their own release cadence. Um, so like things like um, Krita and um, and Digicom and whatnot follow their own cadence. But a lot of the core applications that you tend to see like showcased with the Plasma desktop tend to be released along the same time as as the the core desktop application. The libraries are released at the same time usually as the desktop. Um, they follow a quarterly cadence, so every three months, which is I think why Plasma desktop itself is every four months because there's that one month integration window. Um, I, although I don't know that for certain, don't don't like super quote me on that, but I believe that that's the reason that it works that way. So the goal um, is that at least from a Fedora perspective, five out month five in the development, we would have um, all the rings of stable, the latest stable releases um, for an upcoming Fedora release. So. Okay. Um, is there, uh... Uh, like, uh, how how big into Flatpak or those kind of technologies is KDE as a project going? That's my so couple of those things on it at that level. That's a good question. So so KDE um, upstream is I'm going to put aside KDE Neon because they're a little weird. Um, because KDE Neon is whatever. Um, so in general, um. The KDE project doesn't specifically um, gear towards one uh, a particular tech, say that they're going towards a particular technology. However, they've been generally emphasizing um, app app images and flat packs, and they've been working with the GNOME guys a little bit to collaborate on the base runtime that's in the free desktop one and stacking their KDE runtime on top of that. And um, there's been work in the last I think year or so about making it so that they can do um, flat pack builds. Um, a lot of this has been kind of blocked on their infrastructure churn that's been going on. They just transitioned to a new CI system powered by GitLab, and so that'll allow them to um, reuse a lot of the same work that GNOME did to be able to do flat pack builds um, with releases and stuff. They're still working on setting up their own flat pack remote stuff, and I think they're going to be working on integrating pushing to FlatHub. And so there's there's a great deal of like work that's been largely slowed down by um, KDE's weaker infrastructure with regards to, in comparison to GNOME's. Uh, and that's, they've shored that up recently and and that's going to, I think, help them push forward with this a lot more. But um, if we do Fedora Kinoite, this is something that we can also probably start helping with. And yes, I know I just randomly threw out a word. The Back when Silver Blue was being introduced, um, there was a contributor in the Fedora KDE who's actually no longer part of the Fedora KDE um, uh, project. But uh, he built a derivative of Silverblue using KDE technologies and called it Fedora Kinoite. We have that stuff sitting in the repo. We haven't really used it yet. Um, that's probably something that we want to start exploring and maybe start collaborating with the Fedora desktop uh, or workstation working group, desktop team, whatever, um, to start seeing if we can pump out flat packs of KDE applications and provide yeah. those through our tooling. Because I think... Right. Uh, I think we can we can provide some significant value here by seriously bootstrapping the availability of flat packs for KDE applications. Yeah, so and we have right, right now in Fedora a technology which uses a modularity Rube Goldberg machine in a possibly over clever way, but takes existing RPM packages and makes flat packs from them in a hopefully almost automated fashion once you've got it set up. Um, so that's something we can do. And in the future, I would love for us to be able to go straight from a source repository, a Fedora source repository, to a Fedora flat pack without having an RPM intermediary page. Um, Let's not talk crazy. Um, but, uh, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's maybe a little far out. But I think that's something we can do. We shouldn't just limit ourselves to RPM, but we could still bring the benefits of having a centralized build system, Fedora build flags, Fedora tooling to build those things so people, you know, users have a consistent experience. Um, and we kind of bring something to it. Um, I mean, speaking it, personally from looking at Flatpak stuff, like the, the hardest part is that the Flatpak upstream Flatpak developer experience is awful. Um, like I maintain a game, uh, you know, for Linux, uh, like I develop it and it's a project of mine. 
And like I, I have been horribly put off by the experience of building a flat pack from source. Uh, it, it's not very good, and I don't know who thought that it was a great developer experience. Um, so I'm hoping that one of the things that we can bring to the table is some way to provide a better experience for producing flat packs as an end artifact, because the upstream experience is actually, frankly, fairly bad. Um, yeah, I, I know um, there's definitely some interest in that in um, in GNOME and in you know, the Red Hat desktop team, although uh, it's, it is not a thing that Red Hat is funding uh, their team to work on. So it's, that, that's a, a labor of love rather than a, a day job thing. Um, so the other thing about all of this in lifecycle is one of the things we've been wanting to do for many years and are slowly working towards is the ability to release um, end user facing artifacts, basically spins and media um, that are not tied to the six month general Fedora OS release cycle. Um, so if it would be more convenient or better to release a, a new Fedora, a KDE Fedora Plasma bin every four months, um, I would like us to get to the point where we could do that. And then the, you know, uh, which base Fedora OS underneath it is kind of an implementation deal, detail. Um, or conversely, um, to do it every two years with the LTS releases um, and say this is a new, you know, and then hold to that, um, you know, I, I'd hope modularity would be our um, showcase technology for doing this and then hold to it bit, but using whatever technology we have available to hold to that same, uh, that same KDE you know, LTS release over whatever number of versions of Fedora happened, you know, the Fedora OS happened to be underneath it um, and keep the end user experience the same on top of it. Um, is that interesting to the KDE SIG at all? So I think it'd be interesting with the Kinoite thing I was talking about earlier. So one of the complexities of like deviating from the, yeah. the Fedora standard release cycle for the traditional variants is that now we're completely out of sync in terms of content availability. That's a lot less of a problem if you are using um, uh, an immutable base platform, like um, either using RPM OS tree or building some other technology to do um, a, a base OS that is stabilized and you can stack on top of it relatively safely. Um, I think it might actually be interesting within the Fedora KD SIG banner to build a, a an LTS based derivative using CentOS, maybe. Uh, I, I am, I'm kind of like crossing my fingers here because there's a there's a whole bunch of Wibbly stuff, and I that's my technical term for this Wibbly stuff related to um, how we can stack in on top of CentOS with all of the um, modular content things because um, Apple's not ready for dealing with that yet, like to the level that I would hope it to be, um, and there's uh, some other interesting issues related to like, how do we handle branding? And I, I these are all kinds of pro problems that I haven't yet um, thought through how to solve, but I think that from from the perspective of being able to uh, provide that that LTS stack, I think um, that would be interesting with, with, if we can figure out like how, how that kind of branding stack stuff would work yeah. with a CentOS base, because I don't want to provide this disjoint experience where, where things are out of sync in such a way where like people, people's expectations are, are, are essentially broken. When it comes to Fedora, people expect that a, something offering the freshest KDE stack also has the freshest foundational stack. And like that is what people test against. That's what people build against. It's what people want to run against. Um, I don't want to break that expectation because I think that would actually make things considerably worse. But this is, but these are all ideas that I've kind of had in regards to like how do we build upon like this solid foundation that we have with the Fedora infrastructure and Fedora tooling and and our our upstream friendly ethos because uh, I want to be a premier outlet for the KDE project. Yeah, and this is one of the, this kind of thing is one of the reasons Jim Perrin and I have been talking about putting KDE branches next to Fedora branches in Git, and that, that got held up, but it is still, um, 
it is still a goal of mine because I think it will help enable a lot of things like this if we can get to that. So for what it's worth, even as, so like, I know some people may be familiar with Debian doing, they actually do this sort of thing of they fork all the source trees into their into their Git server if their team uses Git. Because it, VCSs are optional in Debian. But like uh, if they fork it, if they decide to choose that workflow, they can choose to fork or choose to just ship only packaging in their Git trees. The KDE team typically just does the packaging in the Git trees because it makes it much more straightforward to maintain to do rebasing and maintain the separation and like keep updating things. I think from from the perspective of being helpful to KDE and minimizing a patch delta and accidental patch deltas, I don't want to personally go down the road of forking source repos into Fedora oh, for this, this purpose. Was, this was separate from the source repo thing. This was just putting the CentOS Oh, um, okay. Branch. I was That's confused, but yeah, yeah. Sorry. This this plan is you know how we've got an F27 branch, also have a CentOS stream branch right next oh, yeah, to no. it there, and then whatever CentOS module branches there as well, because that makes sense. I want that. Yeah. That I that I'm good with. I mean, <laughs> if I if I were to um, postulate about my dreams here, you know, if I were to go on about what I would dream to happen, um, CentOS shouldn't have its own Koji. It should be building in the Fedora Koji, and it all those artifacts and resources would be available there, and then we can leverage the same pipeline and integration and such to to consume things. Because especially with modularity, things are very complicated if you don't have all the stuff in your in the source Koji that you want to use it from. So uh, in in my um, dreams of the future, um, we would build everything in one big Koji and have a lot more builder resources so that we can do stuff like this without feeling like we're starving everyone else. So yes. That would be my thing. That, that sounds good to me as well. It is something that was talked about a long time ago, and it was mostly ignored because of political reasons. It could be, it, it, I mean, it, I think these days it's possible, but it would be a lot of work to to merge it in. But you, you know, you could you could still keep, you know, like one of the things I talked about in the past was keeping a cent, you know, have a CentOS front end and a, and a Fedora front end. They share the database, they share the back end. You know, you, you, you can put multiple different front ends on a Koji instance, you know, there's nothing that would stop, you know, Rex from running a KDE, um, you know, themed Koji front end and that had access to the Fedora back end. Um, but right. So I mean, part, of, part of the, the branding thing is uh, not merely politics, but with, you know, how Red Hat would like to use the CentOS brand for what they're doing in CentOS Stream, for example, um, where it, they would like it. I mean, CentOS traditionally has been a, um, you know, outside of CentOS Plus and CentOS Extras, been a, we don't do any development, there's no choices to be made, we're trying to make it exactly like the thing we're replicating. Uh, and with CentOS Stream, it's getting away from that to some degree, but it is still very explicitly, Red Hat is making the development decisions for what happens in you know, the CentOS Stream, and community can provide input, patch is welcome, but patch acceptance is, is a Red Hat thing. And obviously, that is very different from Fedora, and I don't want really a Fedora branded thing to work that way because that's not the expectation, right? Like, you know, for example, ButterFS, like the ultimate decision for ButterFS in CentOS Stream is not with the CentOS community, that is with Red Hat, right? And that's just how it is. That's what, um, that, that's what that is for. Um, and that's not the case, as we see with Fedora. Um, we as a community take Red Hat's input, but we make our own decision on on these things. And so I want to make sure I want to make sure that stays true to the Fedora brand, and I don't want to have Fedora things that are Red Hat only, unless we can label them in a very clear way, um, you know, and and make that not just be a Red Hat privilege, but that you know whoever. Um, Whoever wants to and comes to us with the resources to do it can have a space to do things. That's fine, but um, 
it's it still should be you know community led. That's what Fedora is about. It, it's the answer is it's very complicated, and someday we will figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, let's go deep dive on packaging and things. Um, do people have some questions more about the desktop experience and desktop environment? Or application experience, says the chat. How does nobody care about KDE? <laughs> Perfect timing. So I, I just wanted to say that I'm using i3 myself. Um, but I'm, I'm <laughs> I use Arch BTW. But no, um, the question is, um, I'm, I'm one of the editors in Fedora Magazine, and I just did a search for KDE or Plasma, and the last article is from 2016. And I was wondering if we, and I would be able, I would love to help with that, if, if, if there is an interest in writing something for the magazine so we can spread to people that Fedora, you know, has KDE and these are the cool things that you can have. And maybe that would attract new users. Yeah. Maybe they will be able to help out. I don't know. Uh, yeah, this is a, a call to the KDE community in Fedora. Um, write for Fedora Magazine. It's a great way to get publicity. And I guess related to that, um, for I traditionally, when I went to write, you know, the release announcement for Fedora, uh, would go and ask KDE, um, hey, what's going on? What should I write about? And I, for a couple of years, was not getting any answers, so I stopped doing that. Um, I, I will try and do that again because um, that's really helpful to me. I like to always have something to point out when we have a new base OS release about what's what's going on. Yeah, I, question for Rex. Um, Historically, you know, the KDE SIG was pretty aggressive in pushing the new versions of KDE back into the old stable releases. And I take from, you know, your comments earlier that, you know, we haven't been doing that. Has there been much user concern or feedback or complaints that about not pushing that back? Or, you know, like going forward, you kind of just focus on like the most recent stable release and leave the older, you know, like, uh, you know, 32 is the most stable, but 31 is still supported. You're going to leave, like, 31 alone and leave it on the older KDE releases going forward? So, <clears throat> yeah, I always get uh, folks are asking about that all the time. Uh, we kind of uh, had people get spoiled for a long time, that they'd always have the latest and greatest stuff. and. Then when they don't get all the new shinies, then they're like, where's where's my stuff? So um, so basically, as time allows and where it makes sense, uh, we do it. One thing that's kind of slowed uh, some progress down is a lot of the, there have been a couple new Plasma releases that uh, bump uh, the QT dependencies. And uh, it's turned out that the upgrading the QT stack in Fedora is a huge job now. Um, well, it's big. Um, and the biggest reason, unfortunately, is that we have way, I would argue we'd have probably have way too many packages in Fedora that are using QT uh, private APIs. That basically means every single time we do a QT update, we have to rebuild like 30 other packages just because of this private API usage. So that slowed things down. But, and like I said, um, my uh, time commitment to, to Fedora had been limited for a while. So uh, some of that had tapered off, though we do have uh, a couple of uh, uh, contributors that have picked up the slack a little bit, especially plasma wise. So that part has been nice uh, that it, didn't all fall on my own shoulders. So yeah, definitely did get feedback about uh, the lack of shininess. Um, and and historically, we've always been try to uh, limit our aggressive updates to the latest Fedora release. And the one release older has been, we usually try to leave that uh, alone and and uh, focus primarily on you know critical bug bug fixes only. 
But anyway, I think that's, that answer your question. I think that's what um, users generally prefer from my my uh, my guesses about patterns about upgrade usage like there there's a a good solid third of the you know, fedora user community that upgrades with every release uh, and then uh, another another chunk likes to either hang a release back or skip a release um which is and then i'm interested in finding the differences between those two groups of users but the people who are hanging back like they would prefer to not have quite as rapid change and so when um, things get pushed back to those older releases when, when core stuff gets pushed back to the older releases it's disruptive uh, yeah I, mean, I have another question there is an sorry there is any interest in in uh in do a silver roof flavor with kde mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned this earlier. This so we have we have tentatively this Fedora Kinoite thing that we've kind of off and on looked at. I mean Rex and I have talked about a little bit about maybe making it our showcase for doing the Wayland stuff first. Or but I think now with how mature it is, we might do them both at the same time. But like definitely Kinoite might be Wayland only. You may not just have you just may not have an X session there. Um and uh, we're, we're interested in the idea. And I, I see that another person asked in the chat about Fedora KDE, KDE for IoT and embedded boards. Um, I, I don't know how it would make sense for IoT, but I assume you mean like single board computers like the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the, the only reason we don't really do that is honestly because I don't know how we would validate it and, and make sure it's good. I mean, we don't even really do this for workstation or or anything else. And like, I'm kind of like personally, I'm kind of uncomfortable about how we release desktops to ARM with basically no no validation that they that they're any good. Um, there is validation that goes on, um, and we did. We used to produce all the desktops. We used to produce KDE, XFCE, LXDE. Okay. When when um, we quite a while back when. I was doing release engineering, and we were adding a bunch of the, you know, setting everything up. We added all the, you know, ARM versions of all the all the desktop spins, and three or four releases ago now, we n narrowed that down, and I think at this point we only release. Uh, I think it's just workstation. No, the XFCE is the main supported um, one, but we, th there's only a couple now, and, and they do get, you know, um, Paul Whalen does a great job of making sure that they work across. He's got mm -hmm. three or four boards that, that he tests them on and, okay. and um, make sure that they work. So I'm just going to check what we had for Fedora 32. Uh, well, if that's the case, like, if we have a way of testing them and making sure that they're not like bad when we when we release arm arm builds of stuff, I don't uh, I don't think correct. Rex and I would have a problem with an arm port of KDE. No, I just like okay. I, I thought that they had, had removed them. They have not. There is Fedora 32 at least in the compose is KDE, LXD, LXQT, okay. Mate, Sugar <laughs> on a Stick, and XFCE. Okay, so we have them all. Uh, we just have never really <laughs> tried it. Um, go ahead and give it a shot. Maybe help us make sure it works better if it doesn't work very well. Um, and, yeah, there's a workstation as well. So yeah, under, okay. the, under the spins directory is a whole bunch of them. And apparently <laughs> we, I, I, I believe we were removing them and apparently we never did. <laughs> okay, cool. So we have them and give, give it a shot because we, uh, and, and let us know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the difficulty is you know, those little single board computers are not very well standardized. And yeah. the reason they work in Fedora at all is because Peter Robinson is a crazy person in a in a good way um, and basically stays, you know, up all night and works all weekends um, with little devices making them work. Um, so everybody should thank Peter. Uh, I mean, yes. But, Peter, Peter uh, has the job I don't want to have anymore. But, but so. even better would be if there would be some kind of industry standardization around these things so they would use a normal booting process and um, hardware that you could just expect right. to 
have well, so, the so here, recognized. Um, so there, the game process, that, like, it exists. Nobody's using it. EBBR yeah. is the standard for it. Yeah. And as far as I know, no boards have adopted it. Yeah. So, so there, there is a standard boot process in U-Boot. Um, there is some standards to like have to similar to SPSA that requires hardware to have SPI, et cetera. Um, but most of the vendors is not supporting it. And the biggest issue today is where do you put U-Boot? Um, more and more boards are putting SPI flashes on, and if they provided a U-Boot that had the distro right. sta you know, standard support. Let's not go too deep on this, right? But we champion, things would just work, but it's, you know, the biggest David. issue now is just where do you put U-Boot, or how do you, you know, how, how do you set up a, a different boards to boot? Anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> David, you had a question? Um, yeah, uh, and I don't know that it was covered earlier. If it was, I apologize. Um, I, I've had a lot of uh, pings this morning. Um, but Rex, uh, a couple of months ago, I remember seeing some news about uh, licensing changes again around QT. Um, also, is it QT or is it cute? I remember meeting someone from South America who insisted it was called cute. And I was like, oh, I've never heard that. Um, but that's just a side question. I was concerned more about the licensing issue because I know that's always been a thorn and in fact was kind of a primary uh, reason for GNOME starting up was uh, since KDE predates that. Um, and what, well, like, how, how is that impacting KDE and Fedora and KDE in general? That's a super awesome question. Um, so I think there is there is an issue there, um, and one of it revolves around um, as uh, well. I'll back up on the naming thing. So I call it I call it both, but yeah, I think I end up calling it cute mostly. And I think uh, Luigi chimed in on the chat that cute's the way to go. So. Cute. Officially, the cute company says it's cute. So that's yeah. that's pretty much that, how yeah. the that's with cute. It. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so licensing. So licensing is okay, uh, but they're the upstream project is trying to kind of they're negotiating with KDE because there's a I think they call it the KDE QT Foundation or something like that. That's kind of a uh, curator of keeping cute free. Uh, they're still in negotiations. Uh, thanks, uh, Pino. You're awesome. Uh, the chat has some good uh, references and links. Um, I don't think the chat will make it to the recording, however. Oh, so. darn. All right. So it's the KDE Free Cute Foundation, and that foundation is an arm of KDE EV that that actually jointly owns the total copyright for Cute, um, along with Trolltech and its successors, which is currently the Cute company. And in the event that uh, there are certain like provisions in the contract that kick in, if they if if the Cute company screws up long enough, um, the Cute library stack, the whole thing reverts to a three clause BSD license. And uh, basically, they don't want that, so they're incentivized to, to make sure that that doesn't happen by following the, the terms of the thing. And changing the terms of how Qt is distributed requires both KDE and the Qt company to agree. So anytime they want to change something, it technically can't take effect without changing the terms of the agreement. Right. So given all that, um, they are in negotiations for some, some changes. But um, at least in the near term, we don't really have any uh, concerns about that. So we're, we're protected, and we, we can be rest assured that things will r remain free and open source licensed and all that good, all that good stuff. Um, long term, we'll see how those negotiations go. But like I said, they're, they're still working kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, I... Um... Okay, I guess that makes me less concerned. I, I do remember when I saw that 
in the news, um, sort of the licensing uh, changes and discussions. Uh, it was also around um, being able to download the source from uh, like download dot yeah yeah um and that i i didn't even know about that a, a, a friend of mine at another company who uses that library for their commercial project they he was like i can't get this without creating an account but i can't create an account without buying it what the what the hell's going on and i that to me i was like wait how are we getting it now how, how do we download the source so I um, mean, it, it sounds like that's been sorted out mostly so that projects like Fedora and such can, can get to it. So, yeah, so the way that it's currently ahead. working is that um, sources for the latest releases are available to download without an account. All binaries are now behind an account wall. Um, binaries for non-free platforms are behind a paywall. So um, for Linux, this is not a concern. Now, one of the things that the, that the Qt company wants to change about the agreement is that um, even bug fix releases, especially for long-term uh, releases of Qt, they want to put it even the sources behind the paywall. Um, right now, they technically can't do that, but they're trying to. They're going as far in the boundary as possible to make it so that they don't release it um, for people to use. Long-term, the only thing I think might suffer is our ability to do, uh, our you know maybe having. Um, KDE in 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 uh, in Apple. That might actually be the only bad outcome. Um, but if Qt is in supported by RHEL, then I don't I don't see that as an issue either. Um, and most likely, what would happen is the commercial companies shipping Qt in their distributions, Red Hat, Stusa, and and Canonical and others, um, will probably band together to have a stabilized bug fix tree that all of us would actually, that we could rely on, and KDE Upstream would start using that for long-term releases as the base. I'm speculating at this point. I have literally no idea what the hell's going to happen, but, like, I, I am not terribly concerned right now. Um, I, that said, I'm keeping a close eye on the situation with, with my perspective as, like, somebody who interacts with KDE Upstream quite frequently, um, and if the situation changes, there's, there's definitely um, some adjustments we will have to make about our strategy. Um, I think the light, most likely thing that worst case scenario is that we have to stop providing KDE for Apple, like just straight up. Uh, that's probably the only bad bad ending that we would have because Fedora tends to take the latest cute anyway, and so it's usually not a problem from that perspective. All right. All right. Well, we're getting to the hour here. Um, does anybody have any last questions? And say along the lines of that, even though once we've got the source, would we then potentially become a distributor of it since it's, we put it all in the Lucasite cache and those old versions are available, people can get access to them via, you know, like if, if the upstream Qt is only making the most current version, you know, would that then, and would that potentially put us in some kind of, and maybe it's worth looking at to make sure that you know, us continuing to have available and distribute old sources doesn't violate some, you know, terms of the, you know, code availability. It shouldn't because we're fetching the sources under the terms of the open source licenses. Um, it's yeah. basically what happened, what they're thinking of doing is that they branch a cute release for LTS. They make the first release. Um, available as a free open source download, but then every subsequent bug fix release on that release would just not be available. That that's the that's the way that they want to go. So Fedora's perspective, we would never download anything we can't fetch freely. So I, I don't. Uh, I'm personally, I'm not concerned about that. I also don't think that they're going to do this because it it's inviting a lot of pain for not a lot of gain. But we'll see. Cute company has made questionable decisions before. We'll see whether they when they they do it again. Yeah, they uh, yeah. Pino says like they want to delay the releases of for LTS bug fix releases by 12 months, which is the limit of the agreement in which they can hold back a release if they wanted to for public consumption. Um, I again, I think this is one of those questionable decisions that will bite them in the rear later, but we'll see. Um, KDE uh, community and the KDE foundations are are inter are. Um, negotiating with um, the cute company to make sure 
that we have a situation that's equitable for everybody because um, cause the, the, all of the plasma LTS stuff is stacked on Qt LTS. Like that's, that's sort of the point. Um, and so if it's not, then, then there's a whole, whole set of knock-on effects that have to be dealt with. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, chat commentators. We appreciated the um, color as we went by. Um, very useful. Uh, thank you, Neil. And, of course, thank you, Rex. Um, thank you, everyone. Very interested to hear all this, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, more from the KD SIG. Yes. Well, ending recording. See you.